Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, the, the great thing is when you go into the uh, crash area and you'll see me on TV, I am just slightly smaller than life size on the TV. <laughs> so no big difference. So you, you're not... you, look, you look fatter also. Did I look fatter than on TV? <laughs> on TV or now? <laughs> on TV. <laughs> Nothing worse than a converted ex-fatty, you'll see. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see you. Welcome to church this morning. So I've loved the service so far. You know, there are just, there are messages you prepare. And, and if, if you've ever had to do this, and Brian will understand this, um, you, you wonder, is this, the right, is this the right message to bring? You know, um, is this the right direction to take this morning? And everything this morning so far has confirmed that this is the right direction. In fact, I thought... Brian was actually going to preach what I was going to speak on, and Fab was pretty much covering it in his songs. So it's, it's just as lovely to be part of a service like that. Who loves going to the movies? Everybody does, isn't it? Brilliant. Love going to the movies. Love going to the movies. It's class. I mean, it used to be when um, I was a kind of teenager, I was slightly frowned upon to be a Christian and go to the movies. You know, but now nobody really cares. So it's brilliant. You know, I get to go. Oh, really? Your mother doesn't? Like, and you have to do what your mother tells you, Brian. So I get to see all my cool super mov- uh, hero movies now. And, and I, I love 3D. I love 3D. I don't love the silly glasses you have to wear to watch 3D, but I love 3D movies. That experience of, you know, everything becomes depth of field and when we're, we were, I'm good, listen, I apologize again, I'm going to reference Florida. I apologize, okay? But like I paid a fortune for it, so I'm going to get my money's worth out of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I kind of apologize and don't apologize. But when we were kind of in Orlando and all the theme parks, they've really got 3D nailed, you know? It's that so vivid and it's so Sticking out so far of the screen, the cool thing about 3D movies when you when you kind of with a bunch of people watching them, they're all doing this, aren't they? Right. You know, you're sitting there and you go, "Whoa, look at that there! Look at that! Whoa, it's class!" You know, love that. I love 3D that it makes everybody just stretch their hands out and go, "That is amazing!" And duck and things like that. It's fantastic. And of course, 3D effect is really. It's not really there. It's all about a trick of the light. I mean, all, all that's happening is, is lights being projected onto a screen, and because of the, the glasses and the goggles that they make you wear, it tricks your brain into thinking that this is actually physically in front of you. So it's, it's light projection that's tricking our brains into thinking that this is actually real, and then they've moved from 3D into now 4D. So it's all about you know, getting you immersed in the experience. So your brain's being tricked that there's physically stuff in front of you and then they're adding in extra effects, you know, physical effects like spraying water on you or, you know, there's kind of wind or, you know, if you're sitting in some of those shows, I don't know if you've done any of them and there was one where I was in, I think it was Bugs Life and there were all these bugs flying out. It was like it was, it was really quite Creepsville, okay? Bugs floating in front of you, and then at the end, they left, apparently left them all out of the screen, and they've got these little wires behind your, at the bottom of your seat, so they're kind of, you go, ah, you know, and all the, all the girls are screaming, us fellas, of course, we don't scream. I'm never going to admit to it. One of my favorite rides in, um, when we were away was a ride we came, it's not long opened, and it was in Epcot, and it was called Soaring. And what they did in this ride, what they've been really good at designing now these new experiences, they have these huge big screens which are, are curved. And they bring you on these kind of seats. I'll show you what these seats are, are like. So I don't know if you can see them there. They're these seats where you kind of sat like four or five, I think four or five in a row. And it was to simulate a, a glider journey. And this glider journey was going to take you over the world, over particular sites in the world. And what would happen is you see them uh, in kind of rows, but what happens is this machine would move forward and the front row would move up and you would dangle and then the next row would move up and there would be like three or four rows high and you'd be dangling there and then this, this would move out into this big drop where the screen was curved. 
And then you would get all the experiences of moving. So it was like you'd just taken off on the glider and you were moving through the air and it would show you all these fantastic scenes. And as you were traveling over um, different kind of landmarks, it started like in the North Pole and you could hear the water and there were slight, they, they kind of threw up and there were splashes. You would feel little splashes of water. You'd feel the wind. And then it moved over the savannas of Africa and you were soaring over it. And you could smell grass. Do you know the coolest one that they took us over? They took us over Fiji. And the minute we went over Fiji, it was Grace and I were going, Fiji! It's like we were the only ones kind of there going, Fiji! You know, and there was, it was beautiful. And we soared over these guys in these lovely canoes. And they go, yay, look, foul. <laughs> Everybody else looking at us going, what, what, what? Did they, did they know, know that, that? So that was fantastic because it felt and looked real. Everything in it felt and looked real. It was amazing. We come out going, wow, that was incredible. You see, the theme parks have got really good at designing these fantasy rides that make us feel as if we're actually there. They're, they're simulated rides where all your senses are being tricked so that you feel as if you're actually there. They can scare us. They can thrill us. I think theme parks are getting so good at getting us immersed in, in all of these experiences so that when we come out, we all come out going, wow, that was just awesome. You know, that was fantastic. It feels so real, but to be honest, it's just light. And it's just machinery moving to give you the, the feeling that you're going this way and that way and up and down. So our senses are, are, are being tricked. But if you're like me, like I, I'm really, I'm a bit chicken. I am a bit chicken. I'm a huge bit, big bit chicken. So I don't like roller coasters. You know, I do not like roller coasters. But I go on to, to simulate a kind of roller coasters to a degree. Um, there's only so much I can take. You know, I don't like being flung about this way and that. I don't like the feeling of my stomach in my mouth. <laughs> I don't like that. Now, maybe that's just me. But it terrifies me. I don't like it. There was one ride that really kind of unexpectedly sort of really began to, to freak me out. And it, it was this ride here. It was the Simpsons ride in Universal Studios. Now, I had looked online at it, all right? So I, I generally, if, you, if you're not sure of a ride, go online. Somebody, some idiot, some idiot has videoed it on his phone, all right? And some of the scariest rides in the world is some dude has got to the front and is going down the ride like that, you know? Yay! Whereas I'm the guy going like that. I don't want to look. So we went into this, and we queued up um, for this ride. It's in this... Um, Huge, big, it must be a big building. And you queued up and then they split. I, I wonder why they're splitting all these queues up. So some were going up to a higher level, some were to mid-level, some were low level. Then we realized we were all paraded out in front of these doors. It was just like, like, like a corridor with all these doors. And they split us off into groups of like six. And uh, so we went in and you come in, we get into these doors and you got into a little car in this room. And then when the ride started, this car lifted up, and you could just see what you were going to be one of these huge big screens again, these big curved screens. Actually, you're up like that, and the ride starts, and you start in, um, uh, oh, Springfield. Isn't that it? Yeah, Springfield. Yeah, I nearly forgot that. How can I forget Springfield? So you start in Springfield in Krusty Land, and you start at the bottom of this roller coaster, and it began to take you up to the top. Now, it's all cartoon, right? So it's not real. But the feeling of the car moving... And this picture going up and up and up to look like the tallest roller co coaster in the world, right? You couldn't see any land, you see the top. Genuinely, I was wetting myself. I'm I, trying to tell myself, this is a cartoon, this is a cartoon, this is a cartoon. But in my heart, I'm going, <laughs> this feels surreal. And at one point, it got right to the crest of this thing, and I thought, I am really going to pass out here. And what I had, for some reason, I did this. I looked across. I just glanced across quickly. As I glanced across, I could see this theater with all of these little cars. Just the, the front of these little cars and some of the people in the front going right around on the curve. And I went, 
oh yeah, we're in this, it's not real. Okay, even though quite plainly it was a cartoon and it wasn't real, my senses were being tricked. But that little having one eye in reality helped me. So I kind of enjoyed the rest of, uh, of the ride because I knew I could see actually what this theater was like. But when you're isolated in some of these things, and that's the only thing you can see, it's really terrifying. So that kept me, it kept me sane, to be honest, because it gets frightening. These things get frightening. And I began to think, these theme parks with all their experiences, I wonder sometimes, I, I don't know if about you, but do you, do you sometimes think, is life a little bit like that? You know, what if life's like one big theme park? You know, where we're going through all of these experiences. Sometimes life feels like that. It's throwing you about at 90 miles an hour, isn't it? Sometimes, you, you know, you're getting through all of these. Brian's already talked about it, circumstances we go through. Sometimes it feels in life like somebody has dumped you on a roller coaster. And it's going a million miles an hour. And you're being chucked about and you have no control. Or am I the only one? Gets like that sometimes, doesn't it? Life feels like you're stuck on a roller coaster. And there are times if you're like me, you just, you do the one to scream, you know, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. It's like, get me off this. Or we're screaming, God, why? And where are you? And somebody pull the stop switch. Because I can't cope. Anybody been like that? It does get like that. And we ask God, what's going on? And how many times do we maybe come to God in our, and, and we pray and we want God to change everything? We want God to change our circumstances. It was no different in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, there were plenty of people who wanted circumstances changed. They were living like, life like everybody else. But on a national level, in Jesus' day, the Jews were under the oppression of, of the Romans who had come and then annexed you know, their, their nation. And the Jews spent a lot of time crying to God for their liberation because they were having to live according to the rules of another, another power who didn't believe in the God they believed in. So they didn't have the same values as they had as a nation. And they knew that their nation was being eroded in that. And they would cry out, God, would you do something? They were waiting for the deliverer, the Messiah to come to set them free from this. And, and because of this, they wanted to see the kingdom of God would come. And it prompted a question once to Jesus from some of the Pharisees when he was he was teaching. And they asked him this question. It says this from Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. See, these guys want to know when is the kingdom of God going to come? When are things going to change? They want to know. They're looking for Messiah. They're looking for this physical change. They're looking for God to change their circumstances. Because they feel they can't take anymore. When is the kingdom of God going to come? And this is Jesus' answer. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. In other words, you're not going to see it. You're not going to be able to spot it physically. Jesus says this, Nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So Jesus said, you're not going to spot it outside. You're not going to spot it. It's not going to be a geographical kingdom. You're not going to be able to say, it's over here, it's over there. Don't listen to anybody who says, it's over here, it's over there. He says, because the kingdom of God is within you, was Jesus' answer. So when is the kingdom of God going to come? When are we going to see things change? And like all the people in Jesus' day, we're like that as well. You know, we're looking for changes in the world. We're looking to see when God is going to come in and God, God is going to change our circumstances. We're praying for, for God to move. We're praying for God to change things. But Jesus' reply is significant because Jesus is saying, don't look for the answer on the outside. 
look for the answer on the inside. You won't find evidence of the answer on the outside. You're going to find the evidence first and foremost on the inside. And that's significant. Not to pay attention to outside circumstances, but to look on the inside. For the, ki the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom is within us. And if the kingdom of God is within us, then we will be looking in the wrong place if we're looking anywhere outside. The kingdom is within us according to Jesus. And if we look for the kingdom of God anywhere else, we're looking in the wrong place. If we're looking for light for our lives, looking outside is the wrong place. Because Jesus said the kingdom is within that the light we need is within. Like being in a 3D movie, we're constantly looking for our answers outside of ourselves. We're reaching for answers outside of ourselves. Like being in a, in a really good 3D movie, we're trying to find solutions to the ache that we have inside. And every human being has that ache. Every human being has that Something inside that feels missing. You've felt it. I know you've felt it. I feel it. It's that something inside that just needs an answer. And the mistake we make is we look for those answers outside in this world. We need to feel better, right? How many days have you maybe sat on your own and thought to yourself, I, I want to feel better. I want to feel better. Maybe you're going through stuff and I just want to feel better. And the temptation in that moment is to go looking for that answer outside. And this is a mistake that we make as human beings. This is why we end up um, you know, looking for answers in money. We think money will solve our answers. We go looking for answers in relationships, we think somebody will, will make me feel better. We go looking for answers in, in alcohol and, and addictive substances. We even go looking for answers in religion. If, if I do something on the outside, if someone will do something on the outside, I will feel better. But all we end up doing is we end up masking. Masking the basic problem. Because the egg never goes away. Because nothing on the outside can actually make that go away. We just end up putting layers on it. But those layers wear thin. They might work for a while. But those layers wear thin. I know some of you have been through that. You've sought for your answers outside. You've looked for light outside. I've called this morning reaching for light. Because just like in 3D movies, we're being trained. We're being tricked by this world, everything here, to believe that everything here is the answer to our problems. If I just get more of this, if I just spend more time here, more time with this person, if I get this person to like me, I will feel better. If I just have more money, if I just numb, stop maybe my brain from, from working, if I just drink or I do drugs, or do something, just watch loads of TV, anything, get stuck on a game console, if I just keep doing stuff to occupy myself, then I won't notice the ache that's inside. But we're chasing illusions. And what happens is we end up, we end up like, disconnected light bulbs. We end up like a disconnected light bulb lying on the ground with no purpose realized in our lives. Potential there. And all the potential on the inside. But because we're disconnected from the place that we need to be, we end up just feeling that we're lying around, feeling fragile, thinking life's just going to come and step on me. I, I, am, I am one moment away from somebody breaking my shell, and that's the end of me. Just like disconnected 
light bulbs. Because we're not connected to the right source. A light bulb will not do what it's supposed to do until it gets connected to the right source. And the right source is not found anywhere else than connected into a proper light fitting with the proper current running through it. Because it's designed to give light. Light bulbs are designed to give light. And there's no life to be found outside of us. There's no life to be found outside of us. It's to be found inside Jesus says, because the kingdom is within us. Jesus didn't say the kingdom will be within us. He said the kingdom is within us. So it's a present tense statement. He says the kingdom is within you. There's nothing you have to do in a sense for the kingdom to be within you because it's already within you. Like the light bulb has a filament inside it. It's there ready to go. Like a seed has the shape of a tree, the DNA of a tree inside it, or a plant. It's all inside. It's just waiting for the right environment. It's waiting waiting for the right source of power. And that source has to come from within to get plugged in to the right source. Can I ask you, where do you go for your answers? When life's throwing you about like it feels like you're on a roller coaster, where are you going for your answers? What are you reaching for? What's your, what's your gut instinct? When life's knocking you about, what's your gut instinct? Because we're all trained in the gut in- instinct to reach out for light. Because we grow up in a world that's, that's broken, where everybody thinks the answer's out here. You know, circumstances... Adverse circumstances are great for showing us where our knee-jerk reaction is for help. Where do we go first? Do we try to solve it ourselves out here and realize that doesn't fix it? And then pray, and then turn to God. Where are we going for our answers? Are we going outside or inside? Are we trusting what we see? And this is what Brian was saying in prayer this morning. Are we trusting what we see or are we trusting what we know? Are we trusting outside or inside? Outside or inside? Like when I was on the Simpsons ride and I really was at the point I was going to wet myself, so quite seriously, I thought I didn't bring a change of shorts. And that moment when I glanced to the side and I saw the truth of where I was, I knew this is actually the simulation. I calmed down. Where's your anchor for reality? Where are you looking to in those trying moments? Where are you looking to for light? You looking for answers out there or inside? Can I ask you, how are you on the inside right now? How's the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God inside you right now? Is the kingdom lit inside you? Can I ask you in Northern Irish terms, are you keeping her lit? Are you keeping her lit? Or not? Is the kingdom alive within you? Or have circumstances become your truth and what you see in front of you? So are you reacting to the circumstances and living by your reaction to circumstances? Or living by truth inside, the truth of the kingdom. That's what we've already had ministered to us this morning. And that's the question I'm asking you. The question I believe God wants to ask you this morning. Are you reacting to circumstances? Are circumstances your truth? And you're reaching for light. Or is the kingdom of God your truth? The never changing never shifting kingdom of God. The Bible says this, for we live by faith and not by sight. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. To live by faith is to trust in God, to trust what God says and in no one else and in nothing else. To live by faith is not to trust what we see, but to trust in what we know and who we know. Trust in Jesus. 
to realize that outside isn't truth absolute. Jesus is truth absolute. And to get to know and rely on God's truth and rely on the kingdom. John writes in 1 John, for we know and we rely on the love God has for us. What are we relying on? What have we gotten to know? Are we believing everything I hear is, is the unchangeable and everything I hear is the absolute? Or do we fundamentally come back to this place where God is the absolute? God's love for me is the absolute and never changes. How do you get plugged into that source but if you're not plugged in? And just very quickly as I finish, God is the source of all power and light. And Jesus is the access to that power and that light. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except come through me. Jesus is that connecting point like the light bulb. He's the fitting, the housing through which the power actually comes. But to get plugged in, you've got to do a few things. First of all, you've got to recognize that First of all, get awareness of your own life and recognize that you're putting more trust outside. Maybe you've, you've been a Christian for a while, but you can still be a Christian, still trusting everything out here. And maybe you've never put your trust in Jesus, but you realize actually that what I'm saying is right. You realize things out here do not hold the answer. They seem to hold the answer, but then like illusions of light, they shift. And they no longer do what they promised they would do. You've got to recognize it first. You've got to recognize where you are. You see, one of our, our fundamental sins is living by sight and not by faith. And we have to recognize that, that that's the way sin works. Because when we're living by sight, we're actually disagreeing with God. And disagreeing with God is the fundamental issue of sin. It's when we go, I know better. This is the root of sin. Us going to God, I know better. Who are you to tell me? Who are you to tell me what way I should live my life? Who? That's the fundamental issue of sin, is us doing our own thing, rejecting God's ways. And that comes by living by sight and not by faith. It's putting all the emphasis out here. So we have to recognize that. This is the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son thinks he can find his answer outside of his home. So he goes and he takes all his father's resources that are due to him as inheritance. And he spends it. When he spends it, he finds out the answers aren't there. And what's he do when he, when he comes to his senses? He figures out, actually, I should go home. I should never have got disconnected with my source. And so he does this. He repents. It's an old-fashioned word. We don't use it a lot in church, and we're trying to keep our language um, in, in church as understandable as we can. But this is a word I think we've got to keep because it says something. Repentance is a ch fundamental change in your entire life. It's moving this direction and changing it, moving to that direction. It's a complete U-turn. It's going in the opposite way. It's making a decision to change your life by first recognizing you're doing it the wrong way and then changing it to do it the right way, which is God's way. And we have to repent. And it's not just for people who've never come to Jesus. I'm having to repent all the time. Say, sorry, Lord. I, I, you know, I'm putting too much emphasis out here. God goes, cool. Because John writes, we confess our sins in 1 John. He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins. There's forgiveness for our sins. There's forgiveness for the fact we live in the wrong attitude. God's not about beating us up. God is about building us up. Amen. Getting that filament inside of us to light. To not feel so fragile. To do what we're designed to do, which is shine. We've got to keep going. And finally, we have to remain We've got to recognize, Brian's so proud of me right now because I'm using all ours. <laughs> he's thinking he's listening to me. <laughs> You're doing so well, young Padawan. That's for all you Star Wars, our Star Wars geeks. There we go. 
<laughs> we got to remain. We got to recognize we're in the wrong place, doing the wrong things, thinking the wrong way. We got to repent from that. And then we got to learn to remain in the place where the power is flowing through us, where the kingdom is alive, a light in us. But the, every time we put more emphasis out here and we react out here, what happens is the kingdom dims because we're, we are putting more emphasis here. And we, will, we suffer the consequences of that. So we have to remain. And this is why we keep saying, get plugged into church. Get with believers. Get encouraging each other. Be a disciple and not a decision of Jesus. You know, don't just decide to follow Jesus and then think, I put my hand up, I want to get saved. And then you just, nah, I might go to church, might not go to church. Might not read my Bible, might not pray, you know. Yeah. Weeks go by, next thing you know. Months have gone by, next thing you know. Years have gone by, and you're more immersed in this world than you are in the kingdom. And you're getting anxious, and you're getting worried, and you're complaining because things aren't going my way. Things will never go your way in this world. No matter how much control you think, you're going to get. It's like holding sand in your hand. Harder you squeeze, the more it will just squeeze out through your fingers. You can't do it. Where's your emphasis? Jesus came to change our lives. Jesus came to rescue us from a world of being lost in this world. So that we aren't connected to the source which is God. Jesus came to get us connected to the source of power. The source of life. Not the answer to life. Life itself. Jesus came to give us life. Not the answer for life. Because what we think is life isn't life at all. Life's in here. The kingdom's in here. It doesn't matter what happens. Yet it would throw us about. Yeah, we would get rattled about. And I know a lot of you guys have been through this. We'll be thrown this way and that way. We'll think we're just, we're going to throw up sometimes because life is so, so violent to us. But that's not the truth. The truth is the kingdom which never changes. The truth is the hope that we have, that we are journeying, journeying day by day. To that moment when we, as we've sung about this morning, either Jesus comes back or we see him face to face as we cross a threshold from this life to the next. And in that moment, we realize nothing mattered down here. The things we get upset about down here didn't need to, we didn't need to get upset about. We didn't need to lose the light of the kingdom over something somebody said or something somebody didn't say or a position I didn't get or someone who didn't love me or, or whatever. Nothing can knock the kingdom. We've sung it. This world is shaken, but you cannot be shaken. That's our truth. He cannot be shaken. We're going to be coming around the communion table. And I'll hand over to Brian. And we'll go into a time of worship. And in this time, let's remember what Jesus has accomplished for us. This is forgiveness. If you're sitting going, you know something, I realize I've just been, I've been living my life the wrong way. I've been looking for light in the wrong places. If you're thinking that, there's forgiveness. Yeah. Christian, there's forgiveness. If you've never trusted Jesus, there's forgiveness. There are open arms that are waiting to embrace us. To give us the true life. Let's just pray a moment and Brian's going to come and lead us. Father, Father, open our eyes to the illusion that we keep putting so much store in. And point us very clearly, Lord, to your kingdom. To see, Lord, that we are people who live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Forgive us for reacting to people. Forgive us for reacting to circumstances. Forgive us for trying, Lord, the times we've tried to feel better by exacting revenge. 
on circumstances and revenge on people. Forgive us, Father, for not trusting more what you say. Forgive us for trying to fix things by our own hands and not come to you first. Forgive us, Father, for not allowing your life to shine through us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Andy, could you just leave that slide up?